we'll, we'll give it a few more seconds, Ruth, because I can still, the number has, hasn't quite settled yet. So, you know, good, good evening to all our Alice Smith students. We're just letting some people come in and, you know, we're gonna have uh, Ms. Ruth say a few words and I think we're, we're good to start in a bit. Okay, I think the number has stabilized. People are still free to come and join whenever, but Ruth, you can go ahead and get us started. Thank you. Awesome. So first, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's coming this afternoon. Obviously, it's outside of school hours, so thank you so much for attending. And I uh, just want to say a big thank you to Millie for hosting this event and for these fantastic panellists we've got here who are going to be sharing all their insider tips on the IT industry. So come prepared with your questions and uh, looking forward to a fantastic session. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ruth. Um, so welcome to all our Alice Smith students, whether you're watching this live or watching the recording, we're really glad to have you here. My name is Azalea. Um, I'm the moderator for this Tech Careers panel um, and I won't blabber on too much, we'll get straight into it. Uh, I just wanna give a quick reminder to all of our live attendees that you are completely free and very much welcome to send all of your questions into our Q&A chat. I have talked to all of our panelists. I can guarantee you they are very nice people who are eager to answer all of your questions. So I will try my best to make sure that all questions you ask get um, sent over to our panelists. So talking about our panelists, can, I, can we please go around the room, do a quick little introduction, please tell everybody your name, where are you based right now? And maybe one fun fact about yourself. Um, Advait, go ahead. Thanks, Millie. Hi, everyone. My name is Advait Sarkar. Uh, I'm based in the city of Cambridge in the UK. Um, and I have uh, played the piano since I was five years old. Um, yeah, so my name is Jovan. <laughs> Um, I'm currently based in Madrid. I'm originally from uh, Montenegro. Um, and one fun fact about me is that I can play chess with my eyes closed and also against several people at the same time. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting, Jovan. I've, um, I recently watched Queen's Gambit, so that's very, very interesting. But enough of that. Hi, everyone. My name's Sanjay. Right now I'm based in Warwick. I'm actually a student, and I guess one fact about me is, even for a student accommodation, I went a bit overkill and I've got a hammock, if you can see that. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Sanjiv. Sanjiv, that's that's wonderful. And um, Sanjiv as well used to go to Alice Smith, so he's kind of an alumni. So um, if any of our students want to, I don't know, have a little bit of a, you know, Bit of Alice Smith's chat, go ahead with him. Um, while we're on the subject of introductions, maybe we can go ahead around the room and sort of let everybody know which universities you have um, attended and also what degrees you got as well, just so that our audience can know what your background is. Ada, go ahead. Uh, sure. So I went to the University of Cambridge and I st studied computer science um, and I did uh, an un undergraduate degree, uh, a master's degree, and a, and a PhD. Um, all, all at Cambridge, all in computer science, because um, I like the city a lot, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> yeah, over to you, Jovan. Jovan. That's, that, 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 that's so cool. Yeah. Like, when you, when you like a place so much that you, that you get three degrees from there, uh, and, and you're okay with the weather, you're okay with everything, it's so cool. Yeah. Uh, I was, um, uh, <laughs> so I, I studied at uh, New York University Abu Dhabi, I spent uh, three years there, uh, one year in uh, New York City. I uh, just uh, did the undergraduate degree. Uh, so the kind of the, the equivalent of a four year bachelor program in computer engineering. Uh, computer engineering is a bit different than computer science um, for, for, for all the students, just to make that uh, clarification. It's more of an engineering kind of hardware Discipline, although my current work is, uh, is, is primarily in software engineering. Uh, so I um, like computer science would have uh, would have done it for me. Hello, so right after Alice Smith, I went straight to Warwick. And that Warwick, I'm still there right now. I'm doing 
and integrating masters in maths and physics. That might be a bit different from everyone else who's doing computer science. And halfway through my degree, about two years in, I realized, you know what, math is a bit, it's cool, it's interesting, but I want to do something a bit more practical. So I picked up some coding and a bit of um, AI work, and that's where I'm at right now I'm in the industry, and I'm, you know, excited to start. Okay, I think I see you so over here. Yes. Yeah, so Eunice, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are, you're lucky we just started doing our introduction. So maybe if you could sort of uh, tell us your name, where you're based, uh, which university you went to and what your course was, just to introduce yourself to our audience. Yeah, awesome. Sorry I'm late. I had some like technical issues. I thought it was at like a different timing, but that's all right. Um, so my name is Eunice. I'm based in London right now. Um, so I, I, I went to Ellis Smith for a couple years actually. I don't remember the exact dates, but I think those were like five or six years from like year seven to year 11. And after that, I moved to the UK and I did a veterinary science course. <laughs> and from there, I kind of, um, I came across coding and things like that because we had to interact with like some SQL databases based on like looking at some electronic patient records. And I made a pivot from there into tech just because it was super cool. And I just thought it had so much potential and something that scientists, you know, they're gonna have to use someday in the future, but weren't at the moment. So I ended up doing a master's in computer science um, at Queen Mary. And then I started working as a data scientist before transitioning into software engineering, which is what I do now. Yeah. Wonderful, That's, that, that is quite a pivot, but we're very glad to have you on the panel <laughs> um, today. So one of the questions that I always like to start with for um, these type of uh, high school panels is who or what was your biggest influence on deciding which course to study at university? Obviously, I'm assuming that if you're a student and you're attending this panel, you have an interest in tech, but there are just so many specializations that you can you know, get into. So if our panelists could just maybe shed some light on how did they come upon um, what their particular interest is. I think Eunice was going to go first, right? Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that's fine, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Uh, who was my biggest influence? Well, I think um, it was my parents, pretty, pretty obviously. I think like most people just um, like, you know, they were always like, do medicine, law, uh, what was the other one? Engineering. It was just like one of those three. And I ended up wanting to do like medicine because of them. It wasn't something I really wanted to do, but I just went in and did it because like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, but then like, eventually I just found something that I liked, which was uh, engineering. And then that's kind of what I threw myself into. Yeah. Um, for, for me, it was a combination. One, uh, one influence was my dad. Um, he used to run a technology uh, channel um, on TV and uh, he would always have like the latest, it was like a news channel um, that covered the latest gadgets and things like that. So it's sort of your, it, it was a predecessor to your tech crunches and your verges and so on. Um, and so we would always have this, like all this fancy stuff in our, in our house uh, that he was bought, that he'd obviously bought, been borrowed or, or sent to, to, to review and talk about. Um, so that sparked my curiosity. Um, but I was also really into computer games growing up and I really wanted to learn how to make them. Um, so I started trying to teach myself programming to, to, to make computer games. Uh, and then naturally that sort of led into uh, computer science um, at, at school and then at university for me, yeah. That's cool. Were, uh, was, was your father um, a kind of a household name? Like did, did people, um, when, when you introduce yourself, did, did, did people know that you were his son? I think at, at, I think at some point in the nineties he was he was quite famous in India and that was it. Um, <laughs> nobody remembers him now, but uh, yeah, the 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 the, the, the channel and, and the show um, ran on like prime like on you know he had a show on CNBC and then he he had a channel um, for for and it, it was like it ran for a couple of years and it was very big um, and then uh, I don't know something happened and people moved on uh, so, <laughs> so so we got a we got a little time uh, uh, time time in the sun uh, back in the mid nineties yeah. Um, for me, it wasn't um, uh, it wasn't anything to do with my parents. Uh, they're both doing other things, 
Um, it was actually my brother who made the, my older brother who made the first influence on me to kind of go into the space of uh, math and uh, computer science. Um, and then I was, uh, I kind of came to um, my university for, for a candidate weekend um, to explore the university, to have the interviews as well. Um, and there I met the professor who over a 15 minute chat convinced me that I should go into engineering. <laughs> so I, it was a very convincing um, argument and, uh, and uh, like looking back, it was, it was completely the, the right choice to make. Um, I did, I, I've, I, I never regretted it. Uh, even though, as I said, I'm working in software engineering and I would have been better off with computer science. Um, but yeah, uh, later on, I uh, kind of uh, um, had a, a special rela relationship with him. He was uh, my academic mentor for four years. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's the start. Yeah, so for me as well, my parents aren't really technical people. My dad's a veterinarian, so very much like you, Eunice, before. My mom's a teacher. What really got me into, well, my basic degree right now, maths, was I couldn't really settle on what I wanted to do. So I wanted to keep everything as open as it could be. And with maths, you can really specialize into, let's say, finance or tech, which I have right now later, later down the line. So for any of you who haven't really set your eyes on, on anything, you know, you can do that later, the earlier, the better. But this could be inspirational for you, I hope. You can be as flexible as you need to be. Wonderful. Thank you, Sanjeev. And that's, that's a very interesting um, sort of a family anecdote, Advert. Thanks for sharing about that. And just a reminder to all of our students, you can um, submit any of your questions. If you want to submit it to a specific panelist or to all of our panelists, go ahead and pop it in the Q&A chat. So, okay, another question that I think is quite important to ask um, these sort of mentors who are already uh, a few years into their career or like um, Sanjeev still studying is, what would you say is the sort of biggest misconception that people have about tech careers or, or what it means to study tech or, or to work in tech. This could be a misconception that you yourself had perhaps before you got started into the field. Um, Eunice, go ahead if you can if you could start it off. Okay, misconceptions in tech. Um, I think I got to think about this for a bit. Does someone else want to start first and I'll, I'll, I'll carry on after. I'm, I'm happy to kick it off. Um, so I, I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions um, is that te tech is uh, for a certain kind of person, um, you know, particularly, um, a, you know, a, a white cisgendered male um, person. So you can be a black woman in tech, you can be, you know, a queer person in tech. Um, and tech is, is I mean, th there are, there are, um, bad gender imbalance, gender and demographic imbalances in many sectors for sure. Um, but tech is definitely amongst the worst and we're suffering because of it. We're suffering from the, the lack of perspectives that we get when people come from a, uh, when, when people from a diverse range of backgrounds can come and contribute their thoughts and ideas. So if at any point in time you think that uh, you feel you can't, I, ho I hope, uh, I hope uh, none of you uh, watching um, uh, you know, feel this way, but if for any reason you get the feeling that, oh, like, you know, techs, uh, you know, computers are only for uh, boys or computers are only for a certain kind of person who looks a certain kind of way or acts a certain kind of way, um, then that I'd, I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to say that that's, that's a mi complete misconception. And uh, we, we, you know, it, it is, it might be the case that tech has a, has an imbalance uh, in that way, but that is absolutely something we want to fix and needs to be fixed. So don't rule yourself out because you think you don't fit what the, the image of what uh, a tech worker should look like. Okay, um, I guess I'm ready uh, now. So on me, I think the misconception about tech is if you want to go into tech, you want to learn how to code, that software engineering is the only job for you. I would say like uh, picking up how to code, like programming a bit is going to become like super relevant in the future, even if like 
uh, you don't become an engineer like analysts these days in my company. They know a bit of Python, a bit of SQL. That's uh, becoming more and more common. And you can go into things like cybersecurity, AR, VR. So you want to make like self-driving cars. You want to build robotics. Um, you want to go into blockchain. There's just so many things that you could do if you um, go into this field, essentially, just because there's so many options and you don't like have to close yourself off into an engineering box. That's what I would say. Yeah, those are those are two very, very good points. I think uh, I, I, I'm not I, I don't know what 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 else uh, we're going to say by the end of the panel, but uh, those those two points are definitely going to be something to to take home and, and remember super, super relevant. Um, from my side, I would I would like to say that I was kind of uh, surprised by the social aspect of um, uh, doing programming or like being a software engineer just how important it is to, um, to, to get along with your teammates, to ask, uh, ask for and also uh, give help to others, like uh, be a mentee and also mentor others. Um, and just the, the importance of that, because I also, I always kind of had this uh, image in my head that someone who was doing computer science was, um, uh, was you know, a, a kind of, a, a lone wolf, a grinder, uh, someone who you know worked twenty hours a day and just in front of the computer and, and just uh, you know uh, push buttons and, and wrote code. But it was uh, uh, when I started working, it was uh, it was almost never the case that I that I saw those kind of people. Like the the best kind of engineers were the the people who were open, who talked to other people, who were kind of uh, curious and were. Um, also looking to collaborate on, on every uh, possible opportunity that they could create. And that was and that was it for me. Yeah, so I think tech doesn't really have the best advocates. I think I hadn't really heard any of this said before when I was at school and I really wish that was said before. For me in particular, I think I had this vision of someone in software engineering who was by the book, a lone wolf, or like was said before, and they would just sit down and do code. And there wasn't really, you know, there wasn't much creativity involved. But right now that I've actually, you know, been in the field, I've done some work, there isn't really a guidebook. You have to be fairly creative going into these problems. Um, it isn't the case where you already know the answers, you just have to apply it for a different case. It's very, very nuanced. So for example, I'm working with a startup to build a tracker that can count cows in the field. And there's no blueprint for that. You just have to come up with that as you go. So for, for those of you who think tech is a, a more boring rote learning job, it really isn't. You have to come up with new ideas on the spot. And that can be really interesting. Yes, Sanjiv, I think working with cows is definitely very interesting. Please elaborate on that later on. We are all waiting to hear about that. Um, we have our first, first question of, of the panel, and I'm really pleased. I hopefully you know this encourages other people to ask some questions as well. The first one is always the hardest. But this um, question goes, how competitive is computer science given the popularity of everything tech these days? You know, I know, Sanjiv, you're still in school, so maybe you could reflect about your courses. But I mean, for, for everybody else who is already working, maybe how, could you just comment a little bit about the sort of competitive nature of tech? Or, or is, is that even the case then? You know, if you, and and if you curious off. How competitive it is. Um, I would say like the tech scene has blown up quite a bit recently in the past couple of years. Um, for example, like computer science wasn't something popular when I was in high school. I don't know, like uh, 10 years ago. Um, but I, the whole like data science, engineering, yeah, yeah, it's more competitive now, but I wouldn't take it as like a deterrent, just given like demand is so high and we're kind of pivoting towards that digital world, we're gonna need more and more people who have these kind of skills. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's competitive, just, but don't, don't worry about it. You know, there's always gonna be demand and yeah. There's so many different things you can go into, um, so many things to explore. Even if you did like a computer science degree and didn't end up in tech, it's going to be relevant for you in your day-to-day -day life some way or another. Yeah, does anybody have anything else to add or did she hit the nail on the mark? 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with what Eunice has said. Um, yeah, there's 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 lots of there's lots of um, it, it, it is it can be a competitive field, but there's also lots of opportunity. Yeah, okay, exactly. I think that that point is pretty important that, you know, the, the popularity made, uh, you know, more people go into the field, but it also made uh, it, it created more companies, uh, more, more opportunities, more specializations, more like more of everything. So uh, it's, it's not something that uh, actually hurts you, I, I believe. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think um, something else to mention is that it can be as competitive as you want it to be. So if you're gunning for these top tier companies, Microsoft, Amazon, for instance, it's it's tricky to go through. I, I remember doing a few interviews last year, and that was hard. I was doing many you know, coding problems back home. But there are many other ways to stand out, and there are ways you can go in where you can really shine a light on your other skills, maybe your social skills, maybe your, you have experience in this niche nuanced region i know i know someone who didn't really know much coding now he works for a fashion startup because he loves fashion so there are many ways you can stand out and the competition is high but it really does vary from place to place i just muted myself but thank you Sandy, for, for the uh, your answers and thank you um for your question, we have another one over here from um, Kazuki, and he asked, how might the tech industry look in 10 years? Or what will, will be different? What might be the same? We're asking you guys to be a bit of a, how would I say, fortune tellers perhaps in, in this question, but it, it is pretty relevant considering that um, Alice and the students are probably going to go into higher education by the time they get out into the sort of uh, working world, it, it might be some time. So if we could have some reflections on the room about how the tech industry will look in about 10 years time. Yeah, I can kick off again then. Um, for me, I think a lot more manual jobs are going to be automated. There's going to be less things like, I don't know, like paralegals, receptionists, uh, things like this, which could be automated by different software. I mean, there's so much startups that are trying to solve all different kinds of problems these days. And I think like, there will be um, a few that actually manage to do that. And um, yeah, that, for me, that, that's the future. It's more and more people are gonna have to learn how to build software, work with software, uh, use it in their day-to-day -day lives. It's gonna um, probably not, not kill like a lot of jobs, but it's gonna open up a lot of different career paths and opportunities uh, like Sanjeev said. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I, I, I think, okay, I, I have a point about like the the rapid um, pace of, of of AI and the the immense possibilities that might open up. But I might address that. I might talk about that later, or I might let someone else talk about that. Um, I will say something that I I don't think. Well, maybe maybe your Yovan will say it, but I, I will say something that that uh, perhaps um, uh, wouldn't otherwise be said is that the tech has been a bit um, of. Uh, wild west for the last uh, half century um, in the sense that the capabilities of tech companies and the things that they're doing um, have been racing ahead of the um, political and legal apparatus um, and I think in the next 10 years the political and legal apparatus is going to catch up so we will see lots more regulation in big tech um, we'll see it uh, we'll think you know we're already seeing things like GDPR we're seeing things like um, <coughs> Um, what's it called, uh, fr uh, France's um, proposed uh, tech uh, tax and things like that, a tech company tax. So I think we're going to see um, a lot of push and pull um, in the next 10 years um, between, between regulatory powers and, and what tech, tech companies are allowed to do. Some of these things will be good for consumers. Uh, some of these things will not, not be not so good. Um, another thing that will be that's really interesting is I think I'm, I'm seeing, I, I interact, interact a lot with um, various uh, civil servants um, as a part of my sort of policy and outreach work and um, very civil servants uh, basically people who work in for governments uh, around the world are very interested in uh, China's attitude um, and approach to to tech which is um, you know you try to own large parts of the tech stack 
um, large parts of the, the, the uh, technology um, sort of uh, regime. Uh, and, and in an effort to, I guess, create smoother, better, more unified, uh, and more consistent with the state's ideals um, version of technology. And I think what we'll see is um, over the next 10 years, without making this too complicated, the next 10 years, various um, sort of Western liberal democracies try to experiment with um, different versions of the China model of owning um, different parts of the of the of the core technology stack things like mapping things like email things like the internet backbone what would happen if the these things became government run um, or government apart you know co-owned um, rather than just completely left up to the the private sector um, so those sorts of experiments i think will really shape uh, as well the, the way the, the way that we interact with tech in the future i also think that government jobs in tech will will be booming in about 10 years time so make of that what you will <laughs> yeah that's a that's a good point i think uh, the the general argument to be made is that um tech will become more integrated into our everyday lives and also into all these disciplines like uh, like you know um government government policies um you know all all these things that are that have historically not had any um like strong bonds with with tech, I think that that uh, kind of those those kind of borders will disappear in the future for sure. Um, and also, I feel like um, tech is going to permeate society even more uh, with all the personalized assistance, all the personalization out there in the world. Uh, what I am hoping for, and that this is not a prediction; it's more of a wishful thinking from my side is that tech will go into more, um, you know, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go to solve um, more kind of social problems uh, and we'll look to actually help people more uh, and not view them as simply as users and, and to kind of aggregate all these things that, um, uh, that, that people do that, you know, that people can use, but actually go in there and make an impact and save lives and and uh, just make that sort of a grand impact on on the society as a whole uh, so that's that's something that i'm that i kind of look forward to and then that i'm hoping will be the case i have to agree i really think tech will be far more regulated in the future a trend i've seen in the past is that these you know these big tech companies would come up with something and then everyone else would be lying in the aftermath trying to figure out how to, to put the pieces together. And that was a trend I've seen um, happen time and time again. I guess on top of that, machine learning, I expect that to be the future, maybe a bit of blockchain technology, hopefully machine learning, because that's the, the area I've chosen to specialize in. But maybe um, a takeaway from this is that everything is constantly changing and tech is always constantly changing. So. My advice would be keep up to date with all of the most latest technology. I just remember about you know three years ago, I was doing TensorFlow, and now everything's almost PyTorch. So you really have to be on your game, trying to learn everything new, so that you know, you know how to make the latest, biggest thing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. And I hope that our students were taking sort of bets to see uh, what's going to be happening in the next 10 years. We'll see which one of our panelists um, came true, perhaps. So thank you, Kazuki, for that, for that really good question. And, you know, so we just talked about what could be in the future. So to sort of reel things back in, and Sanjeev touched on this a, a little just right over now, a question comes in which says, what particular skills, languages, courses do you feel that students at our age, so high school level or maybe even younger, should grasp at, at this level in the game in order to sort of handle and work in tech in the future? I know Sanjeev, you mentioned something just now, but you could maybe expand on that a little bit later. But um, Yunus, if you want to uh, start off this this uh, question. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I, for me, I think this question is like one of the most asked questions for like someone who wants to get into tech. And personally, I don't think that this is a question that you should be based like, you know, like I want to learn this language. You don't like restrict yourself to that. I think how you get started is you kind of pick something that you want to do. For example, 
you know, I want to build a website portfolio. And then you see, you, you research, like, what do I need to learn to pick up these skills? So, so for like websites, then you learn a bit of JavaScript. If you want to go more data science, you're like, oh, I want to, I want to build like this model that can predict something. Then you'd end up picking up a bit of Python. If you think like, oh, I actually want to work with databases or like more in the back end, I want to build like the, this infrastructure behind, then like, oh, you have to pick up some Python and some SQL or like Golang. Uh, so it's all very dependent on like your interests and what exactly you want to do. So don't don't restrict yourself because, um, for example, I started out doing like Python all the time, and then I had to pivot. Like I changed companies. Um, everyone's using different tech stacks, so it's all it's different all the time. And basically, when you're really good at a certain language, like uh, I don't know Python, to make my pivot into Go, it was pretty pretty easy. It's it's just if you know the syntax. Uh, you know the basic principles it's going to be okay and as long as you're you're going to do something that you enjoy with it um, i think that's the most uh, important key factor there and that's it <laughs> yeah i i agree i i agree with you Eunice. absolutely um uh, start with wanting like what do you want to achieve for me i wanted to make games um so I wanted to make a game that did X, Y, Z, and that drove the decision of what platform to uh, and and what what tech uh, software I needed to uh, to 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 learn or, or grasp. Or you know, I want to I want to build a robot that does something. Um, you know, I, I want to build a I want to build something that automatically scratches my my dog's uh, ears whenever it, it presses a button or something. You know, you know, start 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 with projects. Uh, have have fun. Play around with them. Um, another thing that I would add is. Um, learn about um i, I would say learn about theories of um of ethics and you know how people have decided to decided um how to build systems that are fair to all the people who use them how to build systems that um you know don't discriminate against uh, one group versus the other this is going this is a really really important uh, area of research in in machine learning right now fairness accountability and transparency and ethical ai so um this is something that we don't you know now more and more computer science degrees are incorporating um you know seriously uh courses about ethics and so on um it's not very common so this is something that if you appreciate from an earlier earlier uh from an earlier stage uh, it'll stand you in good stead when you're you know building the systems that real people will use you know put them you, you'll be able to put yourself in their shoes and think is the system being fair to all the people who are using uh, is it is it accountable is it doing is it doing the stuff it's doing in transparent ways and that's important because you know the systems that uh, that we use uh, that we build um are used by well um, in, in some cases, you know, millions of people around the world, and it really affects their day-to-day -day lives and how they, you know, how they they conduct themselves in the world and how they think about the world. So, um, with within within tech companies, we have this tremendous lever to, to shape the way that people behave in the world and think and and access um, uh, information and and relate relate to information. Um, so. Um, so yeah, and and we we have to and and as stewards of this uh, of this great power, oh okay, well, we have great responsibility as well. Okay, it, it, I, I couldn't stop myself; it came out. Okay, anyway, um, so 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 learn about learn about how 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 to be what it means to be fair, um, and the best way to do that is to to learn about ethics. I would say yeah. yeah that's a, that that's a great point. Also, like. Um... I think um, again a more general point to be made is that don't do not be afraid once you you go into tech do not be afraid to to harness um, your other potentials and and interests and um, be afraid to go into other areas uh, that kind of link to but are not maybe directly uh, the the first thing that comes to mind when you when you think about tech um, from from my side I would uh, I would say that. Um, I, I would kind of actually go in a, in, an, in a different direction. Uh, I think as someone who learned to code in high school, I, I and someone who has predominantly been uh, hopping from one project to another uh, ever since, um, I kind of advise against that. Um, I think that um, one thing when you when you do not when you do not know how to code, um, 
And when you don't have experience carrying out these projects, it may be difficult and discouraging to, to think of something and say, okay, I'm gonna learn everything that it, what it takes to, to build this thing. Because, because of the lack of experience, you don't have the means to say, to, to properly scope something so that it would take you know a month or two or a couple of months like it could be a legit uh like a five-year project without you knowing about it and then you know after a year of, of doing it and, and you're getting nowhere uh you you may be discouraged and and you may think oh this is this is too overwhelming this is too difficult for me uh so i would say actually i would go in a, in a, in a different direction and say um you know start with with something that's that's very structured that, that's going to help you make those first steps and, and realize uh, what, are, what are the different possibilities and how to approach problems, how to uh, plan it out, how to design uh, things. So like a, a basic course on, on anything on Python, on JavaScript, on like and any of that would, will, will do. I think Python is the most kind of popular and prominent one and the one that uh, kind of gives you the most um, Flexibility as of now, well, like all the way across uh, the different disciplines. Uh, but it's it's also I, I would like to mention I am not sure how much of marketing we're supposed to do, but there are <laughs> there are a couple of a uh, couple of um, fellow alumni from from my university who actually are tackling this problem and I think in a very good way. And they they made this gadget which you can program. It's called the uh, Imagi Charm. Um, and it's it's made specifically for uh, for girls who are looking to break into tech. Uh, it's it's very cool. It it makes it uh, it kind of scopes your projects and your learnings to this uh, like small gadget which you can program in different ways so that it makes for a good accessorize. Uh, it's it's super cool. Uh, I I would definitely recommend it. Wonderful. Yeah, Sanjeev, are you back? Yeah. Okay, okay. I think my Wi-Fi just went off for a second. It's but, all right. Okay. You're back. I can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> um, what what do I have to say? I think when it comes to coding, it's more of a thought process than anything. So you can pick any language you have in mind, but what you learn throughout the process is how to to tell what you're interacting with, how to tell this computer to do what you want it to do. So as Eunice said. The best thing to do is figure out what motivates you personally. Maybe you want to build a website, you want to build a, a classification system, then reverse engineer that. Figure out what you have to learn to get to that point. And just you know, fill in the blanks, go on that road yourself and see where you go. Once you have one language under your belt, it's very easy to pivot to another. And it's not because you know the syntax, it's because you know how you know how to interact with a computer and you can transition from Python to let's say JavaScript, C++ easily. But my advice would be, I work with Python on a daily basis and it's a fairly easy language to pick up. It's very scripted, but there's, there's another type of language, C++, which is low level. And I'd recommend doing both if you could, because you learn something that's more high level, something easier to interact with and something more low level where you have to learn more about the the bits and pieces of how things work. So try and get a, a large scope of things as well. I have, I have one more thing to chip into that. Um, I think I agree yeah, with what everyone said. Sometimes it's good to have like some structure for, you know, like beginning, right? If you don't really know what you want to do. But also I think like it's really important to just have fun and, you know, do something that you want. Like for example, I have this like right under my laptop. Like I bought this off Amazon the other day, just like some random robot dog uh, that works with Raspberry Pi because I want to build a robot dog just because it's cool. And like for that, you, you have to work out like how to program Raspberry Pi with a bit of Python. Uh, and they also do like some little machine learning models where it can like identify a red ball, things like that. So I think whatever you think is cool, like whatever you want to pick up, uh, just like do that. And then I think things will fall into place. Wonderful. That's awesome. Please, please, um, you know, send me a picture of the dot when, when it's done. I'm actually quite interested to see how it works out. I just wanted to ask all, all of our panelists. So we do have five minutes left, but we do have one more question from um, an attendee. Are we okay to maybe stay a little bit longer past the 45 minute mark or does anybody have to leave immediately? No. Okay. 
Good, uh, Ruth, I hope that's all right as well. Uh, we have another good question. Thank you for all the questions coming in. And this question asks maybe it's a bit more student oriented. It's how big of an impact does the university you attend directly affect your sort of job opportunities going into tech? I know that this is probably a big question that's on students' minds who are maybe around 17, 18 year old going into university. So if our panelists could sort of reflect a bit on, on this question and, and maybe um, come up with some sort of answer. Just go ahead. Yeah, so I think, well, obviously, if you go somewhere like a really good university, I don't know, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, that's not going to impact you negatively in any way. Like you definitely get more job opportunities. But I would say like for tech, university degrees is not something that is like compulsory or something that is like highly looked upon compared to like some other fields. I would say what's most important is, you know, um, doing well in technical interviews, having a portfolio that backs up like your interests, set up like setting up some GitHub repos or GitLab, I don't know, um, that shows off uh, like maybe small projects that you've done, things that you've built. I think in that sense, it's more important than actually having a, like, I don't know, a computer science degree from really good uni. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it, it gives you, I mean, it would give you an edge when you are applying for entry level jobs when um, and, and you're, and you're, and you're, you know, competing against a lot of people, uh, other people who have um, very limited industrial industrial experience. <clears throat> but, you know, as soon as you're, uh, as soon as you've got two or three years of experience, um, nobody even looks at what university you've gone to. Uh, <laughs> so um, you can, uh, you know, you, I mean, so, but the, 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 the I think uh, look, uh, uh, you should look at the, 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 the your, your university experience as um, I guess an opportunity to uh, to, to invest in yourself uh, and se select select your university based on you know how you how well you think their their way of teaching aligns with um, and, and how well their cur curriculum aligns with you as an as an individual, and I think that that's the, the lasting value that, that you'll get um, from from your university choice, rather than its sort of job job placement um, like record. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I feel like it. Um, universities have quite a bit of impact on exactly um, like um, entry level positions, um, which which matters, right? Because it, it kind of sets you up for onto uh, a, a specific trajectory. Uh, if you go to a good school, or if you um, if you do well in, in your university, or you like you have all these side projects and all of that. So it, it kind of sets you up that first job that you get based not based on your experience, but based on your you know things like your curiosity, um, your um, kind of smarts when it comes to problem solving and, and all it, all these things. Um, so those those years, I would say, are very formative. Um, that can be um, um, like um, you 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 can be at a at a, at a good university at, uh, during those years, but even if you're not, you can um, you can use that as an opportunity to to make progress. Like three or four years is a is a very long time period. So um, wherever you find yourself, um, it's it's important that you make the most out of it out of it. Because uh, the the people I've I've seen who who did best in general when it comes to life as a whole were were the ones who were you know thrown somewhere and then making the most out of it and they were you know when you're top of your whatever people who are around you at that point it's uh, it's it's going to make a difference and it's going to be recognized from the outside. Yeah, I think no matter what you do and wherever you go, just make sure you put in a hundred percent. Make sure you put your whole, you know, all of your effort into it, and then you will succeed. I remember being at Alice Smith a few years ago and um, thinking about which universities to go, applying for universities, and it was a really stressful time. I think everyone was gunning for Oxbridge, and it seemed as though it was the end of the world if you didn't get in. There really isn't. When it comes to tech, all that matters is what you can produce. If you can do the job, you can do it, and that's what people respond to. Of course, for entry-level jobs, um, a good university matters, but outside of that, not really. I know someone who, um, someone who went to Cambridge and he was rejected in favor of someone with no degree but had a lot of skills under his belt and a lot of um, 
projects he could boast in his portfolio. So really it matters how much initiative you put into it and how much drive you have more than anything. Yeah, so I'd just like to add to that. Obviously, I'm the career counsellor at, at Alice Smith. So it really is about what you put into it. So all our panellists have really outlined that really well. It's the effort you put into it. The doors can be open for you. And uh, probably something to bear in mind is that career service have undergone quite a transformation just in the last year or so. And uh, Royal Holloway University is a good example of that. So just last year, they made every single course have a placement year. So no matter what you study at Royal Holloway, you do a year in industry. And what they saw was last year, the first graduating class they did that with, it increased their employability by 50%. And that was because everybody had this industry experience. And if you read the publications that I share with you in, in the lessons, you'll see that employers are looking for experience. So if you're at university now, uh, attending university in the next few years, in your first year, you will be expected to have those internships and have that industry experience by the time that you graduate. And a good way of doing that is a placement year or just using your holidays. And it really is, no matter what university you go to, it's taking advantage of the career service that each university provides. It's taking advantage of networking, taking advantage of internships and making sure, just like all these panelists have said, you have that experience when you come out the other end. So university is no longer about just going to university and doing your degree. It is about getting that experience and having all those side projects that you're doing as you go through. And that's what employers are looking for. So you're uh, looking at Cambridge versus Sussex. There isn't really a difference. Employers are looking for what did you do in addition to your degree? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ruth. And on that note, I think that's our, that's our time for um, this panel. I really want to thank all of our panelists for being so candid and reflective. And of course, to our audience for sending such amazing questions. If I could do a sort of a too long didn't read wrap up, I would say um, be innovative because that's what the tech industry is going to be like. Um, what else do I uh, want to wrap up? Um, have fun with it, and also um, everybody build a robot dog because apparently that's um, that's what that's what you're that's gonna give you a leg up in tech. So um, other than that, like I said, great big thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Ruth, for having us, and for all of our audience. I hope um, yeah this this was insightful, and I hope everybody has a nice Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday evening, well all around the world. So thank you for joining us for this panel, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>